Hi, I'm 13 on your side health reporter Val Lego. You had questions about the coronavirus and we went to the experts to give you the facts, not the fear. Here's what they had to say. Dr. Russ Lampin, the Division Chief of Infectious Diseases for Spectrum Health is now here with me. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time this yeah. evening. I know you're very, very busy. Um, we've been getting a lot of calls into the 13 on your side information center about cancellations. And I know that Spectrum Health has already put down its own guidelines mm -hmm. for visitors this afternoon. Yeah, we've uh, started restricting visitors and trying to limit the number of people that are coming into the hospital and then also making sure that the people that are coming into the hospital are healthy. So expect as you're coming into Spectrum sites that you'll be corralled into a limited number of entrances and then um, be asked about your current health status, travel, to make sure that people that are coming in uh, to visit patients in the hospital are, are healthy visitors to make sure that we keep our patients and our staff safe and healthy here. And these cancellations and the restrictions that you're putting on for hospital visitors isn't because that the um, virus is running rampant. You know, we don't want to put fear out there. It's not because of that, but it is because it's a, one of the best ways to sort of try to control what's happening. No, absolutely. So, I mean, the current situation in the state of Michigan is that there are only two positive cases. Both of those are in the Metro Detroit area. Uh, we've had zero positive cases tested here in West Michigan. And so the measures that are being done are preemptive. It's an attempt to prevent spread and to prevent cases from occurring here in West Michigan. Okay, so we've been hearing that um, the most vulnerable are 60 plus and those with compromised immune systems. Our first viewer question is, COVID-19 more dangerous than the flu for the elderly? And why is that? Yeah, it, it does appear that COVID-ID or COVID is more dangerous in the elderly than what influenza has been traditionally. So most influenza outbreaks and mortality rate is about 0.1%. And I think conservatively, we're looking at a mortality rate with COVID-ID of about 1%, which equals a, a virus that is 10 times more deadly than the average influenza. So on one hand, you know, many people and the vast majority of people who are, are under the age of, of 65, under the age of 70 even, with normal immune systems, otherwise healthy, uh, probably will, will do fine with this, may have a, a mild illness. Uh, but clearly those who are uh, older in age and with underlying heart disease, lung disease, kidney disease, diabetes, uh, or other immune compromised conditions, uh, much higher risk of death. And then um, my next question, and this one comes from Chris, if you have the pneumonia vaccine, will that protect you from developing the pneumonia-like symptoms that result from COVID-19? Yeah, sure. So there are two vaccines that adults commonly get. So pneumonia vaccine, as well as the influenza vaccine, and those are vaccines that prevent different types of pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, and prevent obviously influenza illnesses. So neither one of those would be protective uh, against COVID-ID. So pneumonia is a, a kind of a umbrella term that's used to describe infections of the lungs. So you can have a viral pneumonia or you can have a bacterial pneumonia. And what we're seeing with the COVID-ID outbreak is that the virus will attack the lungs and cause a uh, lung infection. What we are recommending though is that people who haven't had influenza vaccination yet go get it uh, because it will keep you from getting the flu and we still are seeing influenza circulating in the community. So this is a way to keep yourself healthy, keep yourself away from hospitals and out of the healthcare system. Our first viewer question, it, Jan wants to know if someone tests positive for COVID-19, what is the treatment? So right now it's supportive treatment. So the vast majority of people who get infections will have a mild respiratory like infection. So it starts with sore throat, runny nose, headaches. It, in many ways, it's just like a common cold. For people with mild infections, uh, they can stay at home. There's no need to come into the hospital. Uh, for those that have more severe respiratory illness, they might end up uh, in the intensive care unit getting supplemental oxygen, obviously hydration, uh, and if need be, they might end up uh, on a breathing machine or a ventilator. But right now, there are not any proven antiviral medications or antibiotics that are of any benefit. We do want to remind our viewers, of course, that about 80% will recover and uh, from this disease and only have um, just mild symptoms. Absolutely. The vast majority of people, mild respiratory illness that, that doesn't require intensive hospitalization or care. Okay. Susan wants to know what are the long-term effects of being infected with COVID-19? You know, at this point, nobody really knows. I, I think, again, the, the emphasis on the vast majority of people recover without any long-term complications and do just fine. Uh, obviously, individuals who have had a severe lung infection can cause some permanent damage, but that, that looks to be a, a minority of individuals with this infection. Okay. And another viewer wants to know if pregnant women are more susceptible to getting COVID-19. Right. Again, this is a, an interesting question. There's a small case series that was done out of China that looked at women who developed uh, COVID in their third trimester of pregnancy. And what they found is that those women did not suffer any more severe complications than other women of their age. So at least in this small group of, of patients, it doesn't look like 
uh, pregnant women developed more severe illness. And, and so time will tell of that. Uh, we do know that influenza tends to affect uh, pregnant women more severely than the general population, uh, but it doesn't appear that that's, that's the case with uh, COVID. Okay, and another viewer asked, does having, co having the flu vaccine make you immune to COVID-19? Right, I, you know, we, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, influenza vaccine does not have any crossover or cross-reactivity to protect against COVID. Obviously, influenza vaccine protects against getting the flu, which is still present right now. And so it's important that people get that to try to keep themselves, again, healthy, keep them out of the hospital, keep themselves out of the doctor's offices right now. Right, because just because you might not get the flu doesn't mean you might not get this and vice versa, right? Absolutely. I mean, okay. the, the majority of people, interestingly, that have come in for evaluation of, of COVID have been found to have other respiratory illnesses, and a number of them have had influenza. Now, Gwen wants to know if you develop immunity to COVID-19, or can you develop immunity to it once you have it? Uh, I mean, my nobody knows because this is the first time people have acquired this infection. Um, most coronaviruses, so there are four coronaviruses that are commonly circulating and cause a common cold. So this is a, a virus that's been known to cause respiratory infections. People can catch that again and again, year after year. Uh, but there probably is some partial immunity that people would have. So I think it's anticipated that it wouldn't be as severe the second time you, you acquire the infection. So let's start with the first one. Mm -hmm. L. Rosema wants to know if regular soap and water will kill the virus or does it have to be antibacterial? That's a great question. So regular soap and water will work. Um, it's kind of the act of washing our hands and you, for about 20 seconds or so um, is really what it takes to get those viral particles off of our hands. If people can't get access to soap and water, you know, you're out and about, um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer would work as well, recommending really that it's uh, greater than 60% of alcohol within the hand sanitizer. Okay, so whether you use regular soap and water or antibacterial soap, or it doesn't matter. Yeah, and the antibacterial part of it, the soap doesn't really play that much of an effect. Okay. Um, our next question, Nancy wants to know if you can get COVID-19 by touching basically anything, fruits, vegetables, at the store, canned goods, money, whatever you might be having your hands on. Yeah, certainly. So touching other inanimate objects, doorknobs, light switches, is a way that we can transmit other infections, you know, not just COVID-19, but also influenza, other types of infections that way. So, you know, especially within the household, wiping those surfaces down. Um, and if you're out in public after touching something like that, really try to avoid touching your face or touching your mouth or eyes after touching objects like that. And again, hand washing, hand sanitizing. Because the virus can live on the surfaces for quite yep. some time. Exactly. So um, as short as two hours, but really can be in the right condition as long as, you know, more like along days, almost like nine days can survive on a surface under the right conditions. Oh, wow. Okay. So another viewer wants to know, how to separate yourself from someone in your home that might have COVID-19, especially if it's a smaller space, maybe you only have one bathroom, you're sharing a lot of surfaces mm -hmm. together, and mm -hmm. how do you protect yourself? Yeah, and I think, you know, as much as you can, trying to trying to keep yourself almost kind of quarantined into your own home. So, you know, if you can be in a separate part or at least in a separate bedroom, that would be ideal. If you have to share space, wearing a mask, again, lots of hand hygiene, trying to, you know, not breathe in the same air in, the, in a close proximity if somebody's not able to cover with a mask. Okay. Well, thank you so much. We yeah. have a lot more of your questions that we're going to be answering coming up. Let's just remind our viewers what those symptoms are of COVID-19. Yeah, so the typical symptoms that we're really talking about are maybe initially within the upper airway, but really the concern is when those symptoms settle down into the lower respiratory tract. So we're talking about cough, shortness of breath, maybe having some difficulty breathing, and a lot of patients are also showing fevers. So this is a time of year where we do have a lot of influenza. We also have a lot of allergies going on right now. So, you know, kind of a, a clear difference from what our allergy symptoms are with, you know, the runny nose and the sneeze. Um, very different picture that we're seeing with COVID-19. Okay. Um, and so Denise wants to know, what's the timeline for symptoms? How long would it escalate from not feeling well to possibly being sure. hospitalized to maybe something more dire? Sure. So a lot of people, if they come in contact with the virus, they may start to show symptoms as early as two days, but more commonly closer around uh, five to six days. Sometimes it can be delayed as long as 12 days, almost two full weeks from when you come in contact. And then as the symptoms develop again, they may start kind of in the upper respiratory tract and then kind of develop down into the lower part of the lungs a little bit more. For the people that are in the hospital um, and people that, you know, are showing more severe infections. Um, we start to see some of the changes uh, indicating that maybe the lungs aren't getting enough oxygen um, and that's m further into the illness maybe like a week or so. 
And then once symptoms are resolving, um, you can still shed the virus, but you know, if you're not sneezing or not coughing, um, you know, we're thinking that a lot of less of that, those particles are getting um, aerosolized and getting out into the environment. Okay. Um, and then our next question, Debbie wants to know if we will see the COVID-19 included in next year's flu vaccine. So that's a good question. The influenza or the flu vaccine really targets influenza. Um, so it's a separate entity, but there is ongoing work for coronavirus um, vaccinations as well. So, you know, uh, time will tell if we have that uh, available for us within the next year or so. Okay. Another viewer is worried about an upcoming surgery. She says, I'm scheduled for an elective procedure in the hospital in two weeks. I have underlying medical problems. Should I reschedule? And that's a great question. We are seeing a lot of patients that are actually taking it upon themselves to reschedule their surgeries because it is, you know, even if the rest of your health is going well, that's a time that you're really putting your body through a lot of trauma and a lot of um, kind of uh, exposure to the hospital as well. So, you know, if patients um, feel that these surgeries aren't aren't necessary immediately, um, then we would recommend that they talk with their surgeon about it to see if it's something that, you know, uh, between the two of them, they would schedule at an outpatient surgery center or, you know, postpone, but I would recommend talking with a surgeon. Um, there's some blood shortages, okay? And so some people are concerned whether or not uh, a, view, a viewer wants to know whether or not you can get the coronavirus through a blood donation. Um, so, so far where there have been no documented cases of transmission from donated blood to patients with COVID-ID, they're not currently screening the blood supply for that, but interestingly, a number of studies that uh, have looked at, at sick individuals and they've tested uh, serum and looked at to see if the virus is in the blood and they find the virus in the throat, they find it in the nose, they find it in the lungs, um, but they're, they're not finding it in the blood at very high rates. So individuals who are healthy and donating blood, I think there's very minimal to no risk at all that they're going to contaminate the, the blood supply or, or that this will be transmitted through blood donations. Okay. Our next viewer wants to know if Spectrum Health has COVID-19 testing. Okay, so currently the only testing available is through the state of Michigan, uh, here in Michigan. So the current process is that we coordinate uh, uh, lab testing through local health departments and the local health departments send it on to the state. We're trying to screen patients to make sure that it's appropriate that we test them. Uh, so we're looking again still for people with symptoms of fever, cough, shortness of breath, and potentially those who have had some travel history either to areas in the United States that are seeing higher rates of disease or to countries that have higher rates of disease. We're hoping very soon that we will either have it in-house or readily available at a commercial lab, but we're, we're working very quickly here at Spectrum to get the test available as soon as possible. Okay. Um, is COVID-19 more dangerous than the flu for the elderly? Uh, it does appear that it is. So. Uh, again, the, the mortality rate for an average influenza season is about 0.1%. Uh, we're seeing in some countries, uh, in Italy, we're seeing mortality rates of about 3.5% or higher in the elderly population. We think those numbers will probably come down, but it's likely that about 1% of those over the age of 70 who get infected uh, will die from this, in this infection, which is 10 times higher than the average flu season.